Hey kids, you're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. I uh, just random note. I just noticed that Joe decided to respond to the guy that was intentionally not trying to pee about Which that one? fucking PS Pro. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what? I don't know what you're talking about. Someone said they bought a PS oh. Five Pro for five ninety nine with a free game. I'm like, you are full of shit. It's not even on the website to pre order yet. Like, well, yeah, Joe went in. All I said I was, was nice about I it though. You are you sure shit. you paid? <laughs> Yeah, he just Are you sure you're not stupid? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I didn't I want to say they, that. Part, it's possible they were just be. mistaken and they got a slim instead of a pro. So I'm just like, you know, sounds to me like you yeah, got I a think slim. They, with I think they else. got a PS4 Pro. They bought, got, they, they you like, know. Most likely, because I, I, respo- I just basically said, just let, like, where did you get it from? Because I don't want you to get swindled. And I was expecting to say, you know, here's the link or this website or something. But. The person who has been like going off in people's posts, like, I'm just going to buy it. Don't be telling me what to do with my money, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he goes, I got it from Sony's website. I'm going to pay it off like all my other stuff. I was like, well, knock yourself out. I am done trying to help you. <laughs> Have fun. Um, I got because- it from this new website called AliExpress. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of Tim? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Tim- That's where I get all my Speaking of Tim. Here. More like Tim. Ooh, welcome back, Tim. We missed you. Uh, <laughs> I've been really excited about this. Tim. Ooh. I've been too excited. Tim actually was like, "Oh yeah, I totally sent you a message yesterday that I was going to be on the show, and it doesn't. I don't see it here." And I'm like, "Man, he knows he's going to get in trouble because he's supposed to tell me when he's on the show." So <laughs> that's how excited it did. I am. My dis- welcome my dis- back. Discord doesn't like jive well with uh the internet at my work so no, yeah. it's it's man. really touch and go during the day whenever i'm out of the house my messages don't go to carry which is sad because that's what we use to mm. make plans as a couple i'm sure that's fine but welcome back thank you i i do apologize i i got hilariously excited at joe's comment but i <laughs> i totally screwed up on you um saying how we got on that topic i'm sorry oh and i no. want to say i want to say gotta- uh I, maybe I should say, I don't know if we should say on the show or what, but I'm just going to say, uh, well, it's recording. Early so birthday, we're just going. <laughs> hey, I promise. Brooke Brooke something. I promise. Brooke Brooke something. Hey. hey, bro. I didn't oh, know. Uh, nine 11, never forget. What? It's actually oh, tomorrow, God, but I'm celebrating now. Happy pro- 25th birthday. Shut up. Y'all. Right. I promise Brooke something. Happy birthday to you. Happy Fuck birthday yeah. to you. Fuck Happy yeah. birthday, dear McDonald's God. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Told you I'd do it. I love it. I'm blushing my ass off right now. Thank you, dude. And happy Brooks' birthday to you. Happy Brooks' birthday to us all. Happy Brooks' birthday, everybody. <laughs> hey. Hey. Birthday hey, one and all. <laughs> so yeah, how's Nothing everyone doing? Obviously, today. I'm just keeping all of this. So <laughs> yeah, keep it. Well, I'm on Welcome. speaker and everything. No intro, no nothing, just whatever. Hold open. Come on, balls out. We're doing it live. Hold open means. Watch, well, I, won't even pl- I, w- I won't even do a, a theme song this episode. I'll, I'll be crazy about it. Yo, all right. No, I got to have the theme we're song. Just a, we're just an open theme book over birthday. here. Theme yeah. songs are too good to skip. Just do an extra happy birthday um, in the beginning. Do it again. It'll be great. Happy birthday. Mr. I could play Stemage's happy birthday song. That'd be sweet, <laughs> he has one? I would love that. He did one for me. Mm. Aw. It's you can like do that and then um, edit in if he uh, if he sings your actual name in it you can you can edit in Brooke yourself. Ooh, Just, yeah, I, I don't know if it would him. work well because he kind of hangs on the Jew. That's part of the no, fun. You can I'm just go Brooke. Brooke. You can just say Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> bro. <laughs> Who's me dead, girl? How you doing? You bro. got audacity. Make it happen. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Birthday to you. Birthday to you. Bro. Happy birthday. Bro. So yeah, the so big make- news that we could all chat and laugh about today is the PS5 Pro was announced. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> Joe long last. Like, it's, it's like the the it's like Didn't this is a scenario where much. I don't think anybody you know is going to go. Wow, I can't wait to get one of those. I feel like most <sighs> people are kind of like on the mat train for that thing. At least, yeah. It's just like no, nah, I don't. Like I didn't want, I didn't get the PS4 Pro last time. I don't, I don't really get the upgrades to consoles, but yeah. this is even worse than every other version I've come across of large. Like just the pricing, what they provide for you, the works is just. I want none of it. And it's just arrogant. That this is Sony is at. back. Arrogant Sony that thinks they could do no wrong is back, and they're pricing a console at seven hundred dollars without a disc drive. And I like that people are attaching, are bringing up the PS3 like this, yeah, like the PS3 times all over again. They yeah. were on top for a while and they're going to totally it, just dunk on themselves right now while the iron is hot. Too bad no one else knows how to do anything good in the industry. Xbox yeah. is dropping the ball every chance they can with pricing. I, I don't like that their new two terabyte is six is uh, five ninety nine, but six ninety nine from Sony is even crazier. Like, oh, how much money do we here? have to spend for these consoles? I, yeah, just I think it's what people are going to pay. I think not it's us. funny. Also, One of the uh, <laughs> articles I saw, it, the title of it, the PS5 Pro revealed might as well have been a Switch 2 commercial. <laughs> like, damn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear more people here, excited bro. about the Switch 2 than the PS5 Pro now. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Or whatever the new uh, Nintendo. I hate calling it a Switch 2 because Nintendo has never gone 2 with a console. Right. Yeah, it'll be a Switcheroo or something. <laughs> Switcheroo uh, would be oh. so good. They'll call it something new. But something I get the Wii unique. U all over again. Switch. Consumers <laughs> just assume that the Switcheroo was an upgrade to the Switch, so no one bought it. <laughs> Switcheroo would be a better never. name than the Switch 2. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, I agree with you. I'm saying I expect some yeah. nonsense of like how the Wii U played out. I'm, but I'm also, saying there's I only one realize. company that's unoriginal enough to not think of new names for their products. Just use a number. <laughs> um, speaking of, I, I was totally like imagining today if like you know if this is 1995 or whatever, and like your dude comes out with just the just the just announces the price, and he's like. Six hundred dollars or eight hundred with a disc drive, and then he like turns yeah. around and slips on a banana peel. I think wah, uh, wah. that's that's what I'm imagining. I don't know if anybody remembers that piece of history, right? Huh? I do. I thought you were joking, just straight across the board. This is based on a specific thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when Sony announced the price of the original PlayStation after, um, after uh, you know, basically. Um, when the Saturn was like announced or whatever, and you know, was I think it was something to do with the Saturn, but anyway, Sony came out like that year at CES or uh E3 or whatever, and they the guy came up and his entire speech was he just said like 199 or something like that, like he was 299. 299. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it was 199, it was a hundred dollars cheaper, is the important yeah. thing, and he yeah, just he, walked he just away announced- and the crowd went nuts. Yeah, he just announced wow. the price of. He just said the price of the PlayStation, what it was going to be at launch. Um, he just said a number off. and then walked off the stage. <laughs> like that was the entire speech, the entire presentation. Oh, it was a uh, yeah. So Sony's been arrogant forever, but like <laughs> that was. Well, this, well that was like now the if PS3 he did that, they were like good job. Yeah, like now job. if he like did that and then turned around and slipped on a banana peel is like my that's my vision. I like I your vision, funny. and I yeah. wish to subscribe to your newsletter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It'll be two ninety nine. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, two dollars ninety nine cents. <laughs> yeah, like the I, Saturn was I, a I, miss too. That was in the days the before that, uh, before internet and news was prevalent, and you had to wait a full month for magazines to come out. And by then, the system had been out for a month, and you didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but, you but found out because you went into like Toys R Us. Yeah. <laughs> and saw it. You By the way, well, because you worked at Toys R Us and a box the, showed uh, up. <laughs> the, sa- the Saturn <laughs> cost <laughs> over $800 in the 1995 money. So, ouch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, six ninety nine sounds like a steal to me. My cousin had one. I played Clockwork Knight on it, and the original I Panzer had, Dragon. Huh? I had one because my brother beat me to buying a PlayStation for Final Fantasy VII before I could. So I was like, "Well, we can't have the same system in the house. I'll try this Saturn thing." Oh, so and you got it. You're a late adopter to the Saturn, then, huh? Yeah, I bought. I got mine with Guardian Heroes, and because Guardian Heroes at the time had just come out, and I got Rayman. And nice. Guardian Heroes made me not regret buying the system. And then Rayman just made me go, wow, this game is awesome as shit. What the hell was I sleeping on with this? <laughs> um, so in the end, the Saturn became something I was happy to get. It was originally the Constellation Prize, but then I made it fun. It was a good system. So Yeah, plus, you know, PlayStations were very fun. easy to get soon after that. No. Yes, they were. Yeah, they were. And Unlike, then also Nights in the Dreams was fucking great. Unlike whatever this PS5 thing's going to do. It's probably going to sell well, like crazy, too. About. Scalpers yeah, are going to go nuts it for it. And true. The thing garages that I, are going to be filling up. It I hope scalpers the, go nuts for it, and then it falls on its face, and scalpers think, are stuck with thousands of them. Well, I that think would bring that, me such joy. That is just not going to... It's going to sell what it's going to sell. I don't think it's going to be like a super hot ticket. I mean, maybe right out the gate, but I think but you'll be able to find quickly. them. Because yeah, there's not that many people that are going to drop... 700 bucks on a console and i don't think there's so it's like i mean maybe there's some first time ps5 adopters that are like all right time to go ham now's um, the time but i feel like there's not going to be too many current ps5 owners they're going to be like you know what i need to sell my current ps5 for like what maybe three four hundred dollars second hand and then upgrade i just i don't know it's going to sell some and it's going to be fine and whatever it's just, I think the thing yeah. that bugs me about it the most right now, though, and it's, I mean, I get it's probably a small time in an era that's moving towards this direction regardless, but it feels like it's just one more step for them to be like, hey, how many people can you sell on this and then test to see who buy, who doesn't buy a disk drive to go with it? And then from there, with the PS6, we'll just outright say we're done with disk drives, and you're going to buy it because you're going to get a second job, blah, blah, blah. You that's probably what's going to happen. I wouldn't be shocked if they completely drop disk drives next gen. It'll suck for back yeah. compatibility. Considering yeah. how many discs I own, but I um, that's the trend we're going towards. Yeah. Hopefully, they at least sell a, a an attachment like Sony's been doing with the the eighty dollar add on that you just plug onto the system. And then I just end up telling myself that essentially, once that happens, I'm going ham hard on emulation just to get some kind of version of every game I own, just to say, hey, there's my backup right there, and I'll be done with it. And I won't even feel the need to pay for some random special edition that can you know. Buy the game again, but this time digitally. No, I, I won't be doing that. I'll just get it where I can get it and be done with it. I have the old disc. That'll count. Um, in fact, I've kind of been on that train anyway. Shoot. I like my consoles. I still play them when I can, but systems like the PS3, I've lost hope in that thing ever seeing like an actual like machine that will play it again. So emulation is going to be my backup for that. So. Weird. So how's everyone? Tim, how have you been? You haven't been on in a while. How's things going? It's fine. Not much has changed. Um, All right, moving you know, on. I, Next I continue, topic. <laughs> <laughs> continue to raise a child and, and do stuff, you know, as I can. Nice job. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Isn't he in fourth know. grade now? Yeah, he is in fourth grade now. He just started fourth grade. Yeah, this is, this, this is like beginning of school year stuff. So um, it's been very busy in the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, very busy mm-hmm. time of year. Uh, mm-hmm. I am... Uh, Working on getting my game show, my Twitch game show off the ground, Super Whoa. VGM Melee. Yeah. Cool. I gotta yeah. check that out. I didn't know yeah. you had a game show coming. Well, yeah, I'm uh, working on it slowly but surely. I wish I'd had a date before I came on here. Maybe sometime. I don't know. The, the <laughs> thing is, you need to follow either me on Twitter or Super VGM Melee on Twitter. And Super VGM yeah. Melee on uh, Twitch. Yeah, it's converting my long-running MAGFest Name That Tune competition into something that can be played over the internet. Without being in person, so Ooh, I didn't I know did... Kirby was from Buffalo, New York. That's crazy. <laughs> Who knew? Once I get my actual logo done, that'll be there, and not Kirby, but Kirby's having a good time. Very cool. That's awesome. That's, well, good luck. Yeah, 
Yeah. More importantly than your kid and your upcoming show, are you done with the Elden Ring DLC yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I slammed <laughs> nice. that. And then I got sad because I was like, well, I want to play it again, but <laughs> my characters are so far away. Uh, I mean, my one character is not that far, but I don't know. I wasn't really, I was just, I don't know. I do want to get back. It's always the thing. It's like, if I'm not playing Elden Ring, I'm like, man, I want to keep playing Elden Ring. Have you yeah. played much of the DLC yet? I haven't. I'm not even there yet because, okay. you know, I got a oh, late okay. start. And I was like, right, oh, right. I'm making a new character. So I'm not very far. Yeah, I'll get I'm back up there. At, I'm up <laughs> at that guy I love. What He like turns into the snake and he's like, now we can yep. devour the gods together. So oh, I yeah. love that guy. Yeah. Uh, that's my homie. So I'm glad to be back with him. So it's not. it won't be too much longer. Mm-hmm. I'll let you know. Yeah, I started a, th- a third character and I played like 10 hours. With what are, what's your new build? He is, okay, so if you've ever played Soul Calibur, there's this undead pirate named Cervantes. He's that guy. I actually um, have played that. That's wild. Yes. Yeah, so he yeah he washed up on the shore of the lands between with his two swords, and my rule is I can only play with weapons that are in Soul Calibur. So. That's awesome. I love that you make <laughs> rules for yourself. You know, my partner does that too, but like yeah. that's a way cooler rule than what we're doing over here. So, yeah. Okay. So it's like it's if the weapon is sound in like Soul Chris Calibur, playing Skyrim. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is... <laughs> Look, this I was is my about third to call character. myself out, but did not have to. <laughs> I did hey, not. You know. My 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 first guy who landed there was just <laughs> trying to fucking survive through this shit. I always that's call what, that. That's what his character was and like. Same. <laughs> I always call that the canary character. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Yeah. I usually have Ted canary. I, I have a name that I I set aside for my first open world RPG character. It's always Ted Canary. Nice. Because uh, the canary is going to go in there and find out how you're going to best survive and then what you want your actual, like, real build to look like. Yeah. I usually call my first guy Trip Asshole. First name <laughs> Trip, <laughs> last name Asshole. <laughs> That's also pretty good. Yeah. I'm the boring was, guy. I just put no. Cam. <laughs> that was actually a joke that popped out of playing Soul Calibur many, many years ago. Nice. Um, but, uh, I can't remember who I used to play in Soul Calibur, but he had like a sun around his head and he was the most disconcerting. What's that? Was it Yoshimitsu? I <laughs> no, he had a flag. So. No, that depends on what. Like... Yeah, yeah. A sun? Around yeah, his head? Yeah, he had like two scythes for hands. And then in one of the games, oh, he was Soul uh, Calibur 3, he had like. It's Valdo. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. That's my boy. Yep. Just just wiggly, wriggly. <laughs> oh, Valdo the guy dressed in gift gear. Cool. Yep. Yeah, like yeah. Pudding. Kind of a worm man. Yeah. 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 Love that. He, Love it. he was uh, Cervantes' little butt buddy. He See? guarded the money pit. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Got one job. All he does is money pit. <laughs> and he hasn't done that job in a long time, so he's not very useful. Yeah. Anyway, in recent history, I've just been playing Astro Bot, and that game rules. And oh, you don't, cool. my God. It's you, so good. You don't I need a PS5 awesome. Pro to enjoy that. You can just buy it right now and yes, have an amazing can. time. I want to. I want to try that. Maybe I'll play that tomorrow for my day off. Yeah, it warms my heart. It's just. It's so nice that it's a. It's like if I Sony is so busy making like these giant, self-serious, dramatic AAA games that cost a bajillion dollars and eight years to make, and then here's just like Astrobot, which is more fun than all of them because it's yeah. just a fun video game where you play around with stuff and it's goofy and silly. And this feels like Nintendo made a PlayStation game. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. The, or that Sony made a, a Nintendo game. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what Astro's Playroom felt like, and this feels like it. Just I just more. think Nintendo has that that seal of quality mm-hmm. in some of their games that is just unmatched by anyone else, and mm-hmm. Astrobot feels like it hit that. Yeah, it's like they it farmed out amazing. <laughs> that- <laughs> it's like they farmed out Mario Galaxy three, and they're like, "You guys are putting Mario in it, right?" And they're like, hey, hey, hey. "Yeah." <laughs> Joe just said, or Joe just said, uh, it was like Sony made a Nintendo game, and I'm like, "Ah, oh, yeah, Sky Blazer." <laughs> it was oh, a yeah. Super Nintendo game that Sony made for Nintendo. Yeah. Oh, I'm not familiar with this. Oh, it's it's kind of rare. I own it, but uh, <laughs> that, it's a really that was a joke a really specifically for Chris. Yeah, um, Chris, <laughs> or, or people Chris who Chris. enjoy obscure Super Nintendo games, which would be also Chris. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta try Astrobot, and nobody has a bigger crush on Hideo Kojima than me. Uh, that's for sure. But they, we, we gotta have a break. Besides Hideo Kojima, yeah, yeah. actually. <sighs> well, hey, some oh, solid I'm references so snake their way into the game. So, <laughs> ooh, okay. 
God, he's so perfect. All right, somebody else. Oh my gosh. Take this away. <laughs> no, can- stop, everyone, stop looking at me. <laughs> the cameo bots are adorable. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Some deep cuts in there. Some guys I find, I'm like, I don't even, I'm not even sure who you are right now. Maybe <laughs> once I get, maybe guy. once I get your gimmick. Ah, how about that? But maybe, maybe. Seems anyway, we got some games to talk about tonight. Should we dive into these? Okay, sure. our time with Tim is on a clock now. <laughs> <laughs> so freaking bummed. Well, the good thing is we're starting with Pernell. Hey, Tim's going to hang out for one, and uh, we're going to start off with Pernell. Pernell, you ready to go? Can you hear me? Yep. Then yes. Rock on. <laughs> First game to talk about tonight is Warhammer 40K Space Marine 2, developed by Spa- uh, Saber Interactive, published by Focus Entertainment, released September 9th on Series X and S, PS5 for $69.99, PC for $59.99, Embody the superhuman skill and brutality of a space marine. Unleash deadly abilities and devastating weaponry to obliterate the relentless tyranid swarms. Defend the Imperium in spectacular third-person action, solo or in multiplayer modes. Purnell, tell us about your time with Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine 2. So this is a game that, upon hearing about it from Joe, wasn't particularly up my alley because me and third person or first person shooters, I don't know all about all that. And yet I went with it because Joe talked it up a mean game. He was like, and there's a I lot of melee you're... in it too, so it's not just hey, a shooter. Oh, we'll, oh, we'll, oh, we'll get to that because I wasn't <laughs> expecting that part either. Um, <laughs> but. I went with what he was presenting as being a solid product worth a try. And I was like, right, see, so yeah, I'll give it a go. Yeah, so in his words, this is, it was, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. You said this was your most anticipated game for the system this year. For the, um, absolutely. This was my, my most anticipated game of the year. I, uh, full disclosure, I, was, I dropped 300 bucks for the special edition of it sitting on my shelf. It looks amazing. The statue is so fucking cool. <laughs> So Joe had a cost, a potential sunken cost fallacy going at him, whereas I spent zero dollars on this and was one hundred percent ready. Yes, to please rag bring on the truth. <laughs> I was ready to rag on this game hard, and unfortunately, I will not be allowed to do that today because the game is actually good. So let's <laughs> start with that. Um, the game begins with your main character, T- um, Titus or Titus, whatever. I'm stuck with Final Fantasy X brain right now. Um, he's essentially on a supposedly a kind of a do or die mission at this point to stop um, to launch a bomb into the stratosphere to kill off an uh, alien species or slow it down for a while, as they put it. And if you've never played the first game in this series, which I had not, I wasn't sure if the main character at this point was a monster or a person or what, but whatever. Dude was hawking, he was beating the shit out of things, it was great. Um, so at this point, you don't have a squad, it's just you. Um, and they start to introduce you to your mechanics at this point, which is a good way to lead into how the game actually flows naturally. Um, you have you have your firearm and your sidearm. You can switch between those with the left, um, sorry, the down on the cross pad. And it's essentially your main weapon, which is a bolt pistol. And then the second gun can be any variety of weapons as you find them on the field. Uh, anything ranging from like a better bolt pistol slash bolt rifle to uh, like it's like a melter rifle, which is essentially a giant thermal cannon that is somehow only meant for close range combat. Yet it still feels really good to let it thing go. Um, but then aside from that, you get the meat and potatoes of what I think what the game is. I feel like the game is more about the melee than the gunplay in a lot of cases. Uh, you have. Uh, right bumper attack, which is essentially how you go into all of your attacks. You have one tap of it and then a hop to do like a light. You do it multiple times to get a combo of lights going. And at any point in that combo, you can hold down the right bumper to go into a heavy attack that closes out your combo. And each weapon you find has its own variety of like, strength, like level of strength to it and its own set of heavy and light attacks that accompany it as well. So you'll be experimenting as you play through the game in that capacity. Um, as enemies approach you, and they will approach you because they do not mince eventually, or very early on, they let you know that you're going to be fighting. I want to say it's safe to say you might fight, you'll fight over 100 guys on the screen at one time. And if you do not, they do a great job of making you think that you are, which is still a testament to what they're doing in this game. Those because swarms everybody- are intense. Yes, they are. Like the very like early on, the first time I saw like a super swarm coming through, I was like, is this a cinematic scene? And it was not. 
I was kind of, I died a couple of times because I didn't know what to do. But then I quickly leaned into it because this game is built around two things. Holding enemies off in the back with firearms and grenades and then getting real dirty when they get up in your face. And that's the part of the game I like the most. Uh, Because when enemies are up on you, you're tasked with basically taking them out as efficiently as possible. Some of your melee attacks can hit groups of enemies or push them back. Others are meant to get in their face. Heavier enemies, if you can stun them or daze them enough, you'll put them into a sort of like execution stage where they're kind of dazed out a bit, and you can run up on them and just gut them like a fish. And when you do that effectively, it will restore a bunch of your armor points because armor, just like in most games like this, armor is your wall of defense before your health starts taking a deep dive plummet. Um, so you'll want to be executing constantly because you do not get time, like in the Gear of the War games, to sit down and recover your health in the swarm of, in the meat of the combat. And if you do, it's probably because your friends are getting killed in your stead. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> um, so this is what you'll be doing a lot of time. In addition to that, another thing you're able to do is a parry, where the game has a habit of showing you a blue light sometimes. So I'll admit, sometimes it's hard to gauge when to do it when you're being swarmed by tons of guys, and this one blue light in the dark just shows up. But uh, you hit the left bumper button, and if you pull that off when the blue light kicks in, you'll parry the guy that's about to do a lunging attack on you, and you'll kind of follow up with like a, a follow-up combo some of which can be good crowd clearers, too. Like, there's one guy with a long tail that'll do it sometimes. If you parry him, you'll grab his tail, slam him on the ground, and again, smash everybody that's in front of you and around it as well. So it's a good (laughs) crowd clearer plus a parry. It is a very satisfying effect. The last thing you can do that I suck at and almost never pull off is a, a sort of, like, parry, retreat, return fire attack, where... You kind of hit a guy will come at you, you sort of parry him, and then immediately the game gives you the option to quickly follow it with a gunshot, to a, a critical gunshot, to kill the enemy outright. When you get it right, especially on heavy enemies, it's very satisfying, and it's quick to get you back and moving, because some of those heavy guys will be quite the pain if you let them just soak up your bullets. But it's also just, you know, again, satisfying to pull off. Um, eventually, this early mission will fade. You will get your butt stomped, and then you'll be revived in a new form, a glorious space marine form, and uh, you'll be then tasked with taking on missions across the galaxy to defend your, I don't know the name of the t- unit is, but you can tell me, because again, I don't follow the games, and I didn't internalize all the lingo, but um, you'll be supporting your from your team, or rather your species, across the galaxy on a variety of missions, and now you won't be doing it alone, because you are being brought into another unit, and that unit is pretty much leery of you, because of the fact that the unit you were a part of before, which is like the Death Squad, what you were sent there under like a punishment like, because you were being punished. And apparently you're not supposed to know that, and that leads to some drama as you play through the game. All I cared about, though, was that I had my squad's back, and my squad had my back, and we kept calling each other brother. That felt really cool. Um, but once you actually have a squad initially controlled by the computer, I feel like the game feels a lot better, even as the computer is concerned, because... Now you've got people covering you on the field. None of that cover stuff that I mentioned, all the cover stuff that I mentioned before still applies, as in there is none. It's just fight or die. But now you've got people in the trenches with you, and it also introduces the aspect that if you get downed in combat, someone can come and revive you, even if it's an AI companion. But firefights, I also would say, I think they use this as an opportunity to make the firefights get a little bit more intense, even because you continue to find scenarios where, like, the fray is just densely populated, but they start introducing more you know, annoying enemies to kind of give you problems, such as monsters that burrow underground and then come up and fight you while you're dealing with everybody else. So you're not even noticing them anymore because you're too busy trying to handle your crap. And now suddenly a burrowing jerk comes up and grabs you by the neck. Well, hope your squad's got you back on that one. But again, as you're running around these planets, you'll find um, various caches of like, re- like ammo to reload your guns. You'll find access to healing items you can use to get a quick stimulus, um, stimulant boost if you're running low on hit points. Um, in addition to that, you'll also just find the occasional log book, which only a knucklehead like me would want, because even though it's just giving you bits of lore here and there, I'm doing it because I want to collect everything. That's what I do in games. It's a problem. Thanks, Mario. Uh, <laughs> so... This game, I will say, and I didn't even get into like the fact that after this, there's also side missions 
that are like their own form. It's like another side of the game where it's like multiplayer missions that take place in between the actual story missions. And it is here where you'll probably do the majority of your multiplayer combat. Because at this point, you can bring in two friends, they can get into the same game, and you'll be controlling different characters in the story. But unlike in the story where, again, you just find weapons on the field and put them to use, in this one, there's a natural experience system, your classes you can use, and those classes have access to different types of weapons. So you might have a character that's only really good at using bolt pistols, and as a result, he's not going to get much of the heavy equipment because he's not built for that. So your squad will have to optimize itself in such a way that the proper equipment is being used by the right people to cover scenarios when they arise. Weapons in this mode also have stats, so it's not just the base bolt pistol. It might be the bolt pistol Mark V or whatever name you want to give it that just makes you know that it's different. It has a different skin, different stats, you know the works. And they have different tiers as well. Um, I want to do more with this, but this is something I'll probably end up doing with Joe down the line. But I did yeah, we, we need to put a lot of time into this. I played some of the online by myself. Uh, I, I did some of the, the 6v6 PvP stuff. I suck at it, but I was having a blast. Uh, <laughs> I, I love no the fact that there is, there is three-player co-op for the campaign, so you and I could get this, find a third, and we could roll through together. I yeah, think I would, would honestly awesome. do that with this game. Yeah, I think I would actually do that. Find a third. <laughs> And I can tell you as an example as to why I would totally do it is because, again, I very rarely play games like this. But one of which I actually did way back in the day was Gears of War 3, specifically because we did co-op. We co-op the entire game. And I was like, this is legitimately fun. I like this. Um, so, yeah, I would totally do this uh, because as it stands, this game is a lot of fun. And I'm saying this is a guy who does not have a uh, large purchase on the way to him. <laughs> and I'm also saying this as a person who, honestly, the only thing I knew about Warhammer was that there's a store next to my grocery store that sells Warhammer products. And I'm not even making that up. Like, I don't follow Warhammer at all. Me um, neither. I, I don't follow Warhammer. I don't play the other Warhammer games. I don't do the minifigs. I don't do tabletop stuff. I played the original Space Marine on the 360, and I had a blast with it, and I was like, a sequel's coming. You're goddamn right I want that sequel. Then I saw the statue. Like, you're goddamn right I want that statue. So now I have them. And I think, and I think one more thing that's worth noting, just in a, just a, a side of this whole thing, is earlier when the show started, we were talking about, uh, you know, PlayStation Pros, and, you know, eventually we start talking about Astro Bot, which is another fantastic game, which I need to sit my butt down and play more of. But yeah. the fact that this is a double A game, not a triple A game, the flash on this game is perfectly, it's, it's great. Like, I don't, this is doing a lot for me in what it's given me both visually and gameplay wise. Uh, if no one told me, I could have considered this to be an, a triple A sh- um Third what is, what is the determination money. between double A and triple A? Because to me, this it's is money. it's a seventy dollar game. It's, it's literally big budget. pedigree with money. Um, yep. And, this feels triple A to me. And it might honestly, it may be at this point, as far as like everything but the moniker, quote unquote. But they could also be them giving us a sweet bamboozle to say, yeah, this budget is as high as most triple A's nowadays. But if you were just playing the game, you wouldn't know that. It's a good game. Yeah. Like, and I think they did a great job producing it, and it's worth noting that. Cool. Do you have any any negatives you want to talk about with the game? The only real negative I have is that the online, you're kind of locked to the three classes, and you can't double up. Yeah. I mean, like, that it, part... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, like, if, if you're a fan mm-hmm. of one play style, and you're with two friends who also like that play style, you're going to be arguing over who gets to play who. I mean, it's, it may as well be like the Ninja Turtles. Who gets to be Leonardo? The answer me. is me. But the point is, no, it's me. totally me. me. You're a lie, not your dick. Hey, Leonardo's me. on my anyway, shelf. I win. Moving on. Leonardo is me. Which one's me, so Leonardo? The best one. Um, so, that does not no, uh, Blue. Donatello's Blue. the best one. Okay. Listen. Whoa, okay, let's go well, by what weapon they nice. use, because that's how I know. Katana, the- as usual, Brooks. Right. Okay, fair. Yeah. No, Thank you. Donatello Solidarity. Hey, He's Raphael smart. is cool but rude. So that's True. not nothing. And Michelangelo's a party dude, but he lost hey. his muscles because I got older. Listen, if we're going by song, Leonardo leads the end. 
is true. The staff one's better. Thank you. <laughs> he he does machines. He does. Moving, moving the on. Staff uh, the staff <laughs> one. Staff <laughs> one. I remember them by their weapons, as I specifically said you earlier. You should know them by color or remember? name. Color. <laughs> I mean, the comics were black and white, so... I'm legally blind. Then. What makes you think Ooh, I might I remember any of these fuckers by their color, and that's how you tell their damn names? Who doesn't, doesn't see bald, color, see literally. Me, <laughs> <laughs> it is ironic that the one who is a genius Isn't guy who, quote-unquote, does machines is the one whose weapon is stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knows. Yeah. Makes you think. Yeah, I want really right. Anyway, Warhammer Space Marine 2 clocks in at 70 on console, 60 on PC. What are your thoughts on this game? I think it's a genuine buy. Worth your time, worth your money. And I feel like this is something that a lot of people may have been waiting for for quite some time due to the fact that I'm comparing it to like how Gears of War used to feel. And it's been a while since we've had one of those. No. So. I can agree with you. I think my purchase was justified. I'm happy with it. And I think other people would be as well. All right, moving on. Next game is Peglin, developed by Red Nexus Games, published by Red Nexus Games, Indie Arc, and Blitworks Publishing. Released August 27th on Switch and Steam for $19.99. Peglin is a pachinko roguelike. Fight enemies by collecting special orbs and popping pegs to deal damage. Acquire special relics. Radically change the game and ensure that no two runs are the same. Aim carefully to survive in this unique turn-based RPG. Unique. Tim, what is Peglin? All right, Peglin. So this was in uh, the Nintendo Indie Showcase uh, a few weeks back. Um... And I really wanted to check it out because I was curious to see if my kid would like it, which he does. Um, so there you go. Buy it. Boom. All right. Bye. Good having you on. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Peglin. Yeah. So this, you know, what, what struck me about it and just seeing the trailer is like, oh, you took like some roguelite, maybe even, you know, that, that old game puzzle quest, that old match three. We're going to, you know take a match three game and make it an RPG, but you know, we're going to, we're going to take like a roguelite. We're going to take like a puzzle RPG and we're going to give it, you know, mechanics of Peggle. Uh, hence, and you're a little goblin, hence the name Peglin, Peggle goblin. It's a, it's a little mashup there. Um, and Peggle is a great game. Uh, still, uh, to this day holds up very well. Uh, and I saw the trailer and I was like, Oh, that's genius. Of course. Why has no one done this before? Uh, what a great idea. So you start out, you're a little, you're a little goblin dude. Uh, you start off your run. Uh, you have a deck of like a deck, air quotes, uh, of like four balls, I think. I want to say you start out with you start out with some normal balls. You start out with one that's like a dagger ball. Ooh, special balls. And so, you know, to kick things off, the dagger ball, uh, you know, regular balls do regular damage. The dagger ball does a little bit of damage, but if you hit a crit uh, on the turn you shoot the uh, the dagger ball, it does a ton of damage. So on the boards, uh, these peg boards that are laid out, there will be a bunch of normal pegs. Uh, there will always be like these little green ones that will refresh the pegs on the board because you're not looking to clear the board of pegs. You need to utilize the pegs in order to deal damage and do stuff to destroy enemies. Um, so that is where, you know, it, it immediately drifts away from the classic Peggle format. You're not just like looking to clear a stage. You are, you are weaponizing it. Um, so there'll be these little green ones that'll refresh the pegs. And then there will be a, a little yellow exclamation point. If you get that little ex yellow exclamation point peg that activates the crit and everything will do more damage, you know, critical hits, RPGs, it just does more damage. Um, those pegs will kind of like move around, like as you activate them. Uh, and refresh ever so many turns because sometimes it's like you need to refresh pegs but the little refresh peg pegs will be like down in the corner and really hard to get at uh so you know basically you're not fighting against uh you don't have like a limited number of balls what you have is a limited number of life uh so you're trying to defeat the monsters that are attacking you before they can walk up to you and stab you a bunch of times and kill you dead um You'll clear a stage, uh, you'll earn gold. Some pegs have like a little gold piece in them and you'll get some uh, gold for clearing the level. So you accrue currency 
to spend on upgrading your deck, your your loadout, your what you know, your balls. <laughs> you buy more <laughs> balls. Um, yeah, after every stage, you have, you have the opportunity to either they'll give you an array of balls that you could purchase. Um, usually, you'll be able to afford uh, you know a couple things at the end of level, depending on how good you are at accruing your gold. But usually, at least one thing, unless things went really south. Uh, you can buy a ball. You can upgrade a ball that you already have, or you can restore some health to yourself, which is, you know, boring, but you have to do it every now and then. Um, so what are these balls? Uh, these probably the largest thing that will determine how your run is going to go. Well, they have, you know, different properties. Some will poison enemies, some stack damage, some do debuffs, some will uh, give you different bonuses if you hit like a large number of balls. There's the multi-ball ball, which is, of course, a big favorite of mine. Multi-ball is just fun. So you'll hit, you'll shoot that thing out, and it'll hit a peg, and then it'll turn into two balls. But then it's like if you upgrade the multi-ball ball, instead of two balls, you get three balls. Instead of three balls, you get four balls. So uh, numbers go up uh, as you upgrade them. Um, and you buy. Uh, will have the opportunity to you know kind of customize your build in a certain way towards certain things uh it's not as you know apparent as in, i don't know it didn't come as natural to me in in some other roguelites uh you don't want to compare everything to hades but it's like you know the the upgrade and paths and, and the way things stitch together in that game were very obvious it's not always obvious in this one kind of which way you want to go um but another thing that can really uh, help you uh, move through is you also pick up relics, which have so much. I want to say they have generally a bigger effect on things. These are passive. These just kind of sit in your inventory. Uh, like I got one. I, I had a really good run. Uh, actually, last time I played, there was one that limited my range of uh, aiming to only four vectors, but it shot out two balls. So it very much limited uh you know where i could aim but it was shooting out two balls and it was just causing a ruckus no matter what because two balls were going out instead of just one so yeah clear stage you buy some stuff um and then you'll select a path so they'll have like a you know big map with nodes on it i know we got some node lovers on this show uh you'll have nodes that'll have you know oh there's a shop here which has a much larger variety of things you can buy and usually for lower prices here there's a treasure chest uh which just gets you some good stuff there's lots of question marks on the grid which can be events that will let you you know upgrade your loadout um get you items get you hurt uh lots of different things can happen or there's of course more monsters there's boss monsters um the way enemies come at you um they'll come at you with there's a good variety of enemies there'll be some that'll be like flying some that are on the ground some that have shields uh and you can target them and there are going to be balls and abilities and things that will take advantage of being able to target things in the middle of the crowd or not uh you'll get balls that will have piercing damage that can hit a bunch of enemies in a line um and everything's broke up into stages so you'll go through i don't know eight nine nodes on a particular map and then you'll get down to a boss fight uh you clear the boss fight you get a bunch of treasure you move on to the next map and you do it all over again and the numbers go up the challenge goes up uh and you're trying to plow through a run to the end um and like generally speaking it's pretty fun it's pretty solid. It does what it advertises to do and that you're getting peggle mechanics. You're getting peggle pachinko mechanics in a roguelite RPG format, and it all works pretty well together. Uh, you have a good variety of, you know, <laughs> balls and builds to try out. Uh, you have, uh, fortunately, like one, one of the good things about the game is, is they know that after a while, shooting a ball and watching it kind of bounce around when you're doing these runs over and over again can get tedious. So in the options, they have the option of turning up the game speed. Um, and you can toggle that like in the middle of a run uh, because there will be moments when it's like, 
uh, <laughs> sometimes there will be moving elements on the pegboard uh, and you need to take more careful aim. So you can just with a touch of a button, turn down the game speed to normal, aim your shot, shoot it off and then speed it up again. So the ball will go around. You're moving, uh, you know, just faster through these levels. I will say <clears throat> overall, the like something about just the general physics and feedback uh, is just not as satisfying as I would have liked it to be. Um, it just didn't like tweak the little, you know, pleasure zones in my brain as much. Uh, give me that little dopamine shot quite as much as like a peggle would. I mean, like this is a much more drab color scheme of browns and grays and such as you're going through forests and dungeons and castles and whatnot. So it's not quite as like colorful and explosive. Um, it's much more muted. Uh, sometimes, I don't know, the balls have more bounce than I would have expected them to. And my shots, you know, just just kind of acclimating to the physics. Um, just sometimes I felt like I had a tough time navigating, like, a, like landing on how exactly my build was going to work. Um, and it can be challenging sometimes when just like the board state, you know, like you have a good build and the board states just don't fall in your direction because of just the entropy of balls bouncing around, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it, like I said, it's solid. It does, you know, it, it is good at what it, you know, presents itself to do. There are other characters to unlock. I, despite my best efforts in trying to like meet the requirements for unlocking them, I have not been able to do that yet. Uh, but there's only like a couple of them, so it's nothing too crazy. But yeah, there's like tons of different balls and relics and, and stuff to muck around with. Um, I didn't find it something that like it was pretty much a game like I would do one run and then put it down and then maybe the next day I'd pick it up and do a run. Uh, so it's not something you're going to like marathon through. It's not like you finish a run and you're I at least personally did not feel the need to be like, I'm going to jump right back in there. It's like, no, it's just like kind of play a run, put it down, play it the next day. That's fine. You know, um, but like I said at the top, like, you know, my kid, he enjoys Peggle. He really enjoyed, you know, playing this game. Um, so, yeah, it was a pretty good time. Cool. Sounds like you had fun. It clocks yeah. in at 20 bucks. What are your thoughts on Peglin? Yeah, I think it's worth a purchase. Uh, it's solid. Like, it's not a <laughs> I don't want to say it's like a must buy. Like, it's not like, a, oh, my God, this is the indie gem you've been waiting for. Um, but, you know, if if it is, if you look at that and you're like, oh, man, that looks cool. I wonder if it does the thing. Well, it does the thing. Well, um, it's not going to blow your mind, but it's going to do the thing it sets out to do and you're going to have a good time with it. And I think you're going to get your money's worth out of it. Um, yeah. And you get to play with balls and you get to play with balls. balls there you go. There we go. Nice. Tim, always a pleasure having you on. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, tell us where can Let's people keep up to date with you and what you're doing and oh your next God. Uh, song fight and all that other stuff. Nobody uses Twitter anymore, but that's the best place. <laughs> I do. Thank you. Yeah, you you do. It's I'm at, I'm at, <laughs> at Super VGM Melee is the best place to find me on. Well, to find updates on the game show specifically on Twitter, and you know, give that a a follow on Twitch or a like on Twitch or whatever, because then you'll get the notifications for when I go live. Um, but yeah, on Twitter I'm at Acubizer, which I'm tagged in the tweet about this very show, because uh, I'll be posting it all there as well but yeah yay yay, yay. Cool. all right i gotta go play a little more astrobot before i go to bed <laughs> all right enjoy your astrobot i was like game. right at the end of a level <laughs> how I far like, are you? i gotta get in there uh i'm on the third world nice but i want to do the third boss so i can see what the third like special stage is about how long would you say it took you to get there i'm curious about like the amount of time i'm looking to spend in that game so I want to say I'm uh, I'm trying to think what I should. I think the game is going to clock somewhere between like 15 to 20 hours if you're doing if you're getting everything which I'm going to do. Um I want to say I was at like 4 or 5 hours after getting through the second world, I want to say. Uh 
So yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff. It's not like a super short game by any means. I mean, like ten to fifteen is kind of my sweet spot for how long I want games to be these days. But yeah, yeah, yeah so I, I haven't looked at it in a bit. What the time is at? That makes me feel good to hear. Then so I'm good. Yeah, and that game's only sixty instead of seventy. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's a Bye double Astrobot. A game. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah! Oh my god! I mean, you don't need me to tell you that. I think everyone's been saying that for the past few days. Yeah. All right. Catch you have any later. final words, Tim? No. Good night. I asked you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I was mean, really good. I mean, I actually didn't even know that game was going was in existence until like Thursday of last week, and a friend was like, "You should get this game." I was like, "There's a full Astrobot thing." I was like, oh, yeah. Man. I was like, "Dude, it is well, so good." I'll go ahead and buy it. I bought it the day he told me about it, and it came in the mail the next day. And I was like, "Well, nice. I'll play it when I have some time, and that might be tonight before I go to bed." Just like Tim's talking about, because <laughs> the itch is growing. So, all right. Well, moving on. Next game to talk about is Celestia: Chain of Fate, developed by Agate, published by PCube, released September twelfth on Switch and Steam for twenty nine ninety nine. A romance fantasy visual novel that delivers a captivating player driven narrative. Enroll at Celestia Academy and uncover your heritage, delve into a fantastical realm, and unearth your magical potential as a hybrid. Forge new friendships, build affections based on your love interests. Brooke, tell us about your time with Celestia Chain of Fate. Hey, well, as this game opens, we learned that long ago there was an angel and a demon. They boned, stay with me here, <laughs> and they had kids. They had, they had kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew you'd like that, Aggie. But this relationship was forbidden, and the kids didn't really belong anywhere. Turns out we, the main character, our player character, Arya, if we want to name her after ourselves, we can. This game's not voiced, so go crazy there. We are one of those offspring, but we don't know it yet. We are just calmly getting ready for our 18th birthday. We're finally an adult today. Hey, it's my birthday too, as you know. I'm turning uh, <laughs> 18 tomorrow. <laughs> 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 uh maids dress us up for the day as we are a very rich girl and we're not just rich but our family is nobility human nobility of course what other kind of nobility is there we don't even know there are things other than humans so imagine our surprise when a rabbit that's right a rabbit calm down brooke dressed as a mailman pops up at our birthday party stop crying brooke to give us a message we have been accepted into magic school but wait magic doesn't exist right mom dad <laughs> Mom and dad and your two brothers roll up and they're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's uh, finally time to tell you. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> Brooke, you're a magical being. <laughs> and you're about to go to boarding school for it. Surprise. See you later. And surprise, you're also half Angelus, half Damon, which is rare. That's like two kinds of magical beings in one. You're adopted. Matt Damon? You're a, uh, half Damon. You're half Angelus. Oh, I thought you said Matt Damon. I'm like, what? Damon. <laughs> is, Matt Damon. Is Matt Damon a Damon? by uh purposes of this game we don't know yet we'll we'll uh dive more into that later but yeah so half angelus half damon that's what you are that's rare that's like two kinds of magical beings in one you were adopted original angelus and damon who had you as their literally god forsaken love child they're not around they couldn't take care of you you've been raised with this family they were good to bunch you but of now dead it's beats a bunch of freaking <laughs> losers they were good to you, but now it's time to go to wizard school with your adopted brother. He's a full-blooded Damon. His name is Damien. Stay with me here. Once we head <laughs> to wizard school, we're not even on platform nine and three quarters yet, but shit has started to go down. Multiple people <laughs> have to help us. This is where we meet our love interest for the first time. The first one's name is Ash. He's got blue hair. He's got kind of a princely stoic thing going on. He seems nice. But I'm out here trying to talk to his mom. I'm just going to say it. I don't care about him, but his mom is smoking. But as hot as she is, she is the second most beautiful blue-haired milf of Otome. The first one is Riku's mom from Olympia Soiree. So it goes without saying that if you're a beautiful blue man with a blue mom, you're probably not my first pick in your family. I can't believe I wrote that line. That's really weird. That was my main <laughs> takeaway from this game. <laughs> that was my main takeaway from this game. That's what I learned about myself so through this hair. experience. Uh, and I know my I know favorite part is. wasn't the line. It was you saying, why did I write that? <laughs> that happens too much on the show, as you may recall. OK, so I know I know she was that. Thank you, Purnell. So I know Shura is not Riku's mom, okay? It's just a fantasy. You don't come for me. The second love interest of this game is Luke. This is my fave. I love this guy. If you get this game, get it for him. He is also the only one of them that I think is the top type of uh, top I would like. He's sweet, but he's also just cool. He won't tolerate bullshit. Yeah, he's pretty sexy about that. If 
finally, there's Val de Lucifer. Val for short. Hey, hey, don't be like that. Nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's a daemon, but he's a really good guy. He's one of those people who can't look away. Someone is suffering. We love it, but he can be a little rude because he's just awkward. We directly benefit from this. If we compliment him, if we tell him he's cool, he'll blush and be like, k -k 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 cool. Uh, and he looks kind of pissed off because he's obviously just freaking out trying to ride the wave of being too affected by your compliment. So that guy's all right. If you only have one thing going for you that I would personally like and want to date, that's actually a pretty good one. Okay, so we discussed our setup and our three LIs. So how did I like the game? Well, let's break it down, starting with graphics. The art of this game is really good. The character designs look good. The backgrounds are fantastic. So it is a bit of a shame if you play this game on Switch. All three of the love interest sprites are a little blurry and a little pixelated, which normally I can forgive because I don't have a high resolution image need for my visual novel dating games. You see, back in my day, they didn't even call it pixel art. It was just art. But seriously, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't care at, at all, except all this, not all the sprites look like that. And frequently one sprite is standing next to another and it's almost impossible to ignore. And it's a shame that it's the love interest in the main character sprite specifically, because it's an Atomi game, so we see and care about them the most. I do think it's obvious if you're playing it docked on a big screen, but it is more obvious if you play this on Switch handheld. You know, y'all know I have a high tolerance for bullshit. I'm an anime fan. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is my favorite anime. So I don't need things to be perfect to be amazing to me, but I could not play this handheld personally. We did reach out to PCube. They said there's not a, plat a patch planned for the Switch at this time. I did hear from another reviewer today that this is not an issue if you buy the Steam version of the game. So let's talk music and sound design. I found the music to be good. Definitely something I wouldn't mind listening to for like 40 hours of my life. And that's not nothing. The music fit the theme well. And I found the music to make this game more immersive. This game doesn't have voice acting, as we mentioned briefly before, but let's just make it clear. But it does have sound effects, uh, a lot more sound effects than your average game. And the soundscaping is good. It's creepy when it wants to be creepy. It's funny when it's trying to be funny. And I was really impressed by all the sound effects and how they're used to communicate motion and, and things the sprites are doing that I actually haven't seen before. So let's talk story. This wasn't my favorite story. I found it to be a little bit generic. It would just simply be hard for me to sell this game on story and love interest alone. And I don't find any of the characters to be awful. The story is immersive and playable. And it is interesting as a little fantasy game. But it personally just wasn't my favorite thing to read. I was a little bit... I guess I felt the story might be lacking a little spirit or depth that I've come to expect from big major release Atome games that are in the 30 or more price point by a major company uh, like this. I know it's a little bit personal taste on my part, but I know that if you're following me or Hannah in the Atome community specifically, I mean, think about both the Atome panels we had at Anime Expo this year, not just ours. We are adults playing Atome games. Even Hiroto from the Ikemen series, a Japanese Atome expert, acknowledges that these are now aimed at an older crowd than they used to be, especially the ones that get localized over here for the West. I found this story to be more appropriate for probably the youngest of Atome fans, but I'm sure there's some people this will resonate with. So this may be a romance game, but it definitely feels meant for more of an innocent coming-of-age story than your, your average one. More than Radiant Tale, if that puts it into context. This game can be emotional, though it, it certainly does have its darker, more emotional moments the further we get into the plot. And the game talks about uh, big stuff like not judging someone if they're a little different. Say, if they're a daemon, you're an angelus, that doesn't mean they're mean and you're nice. And people can be really horrible, whether they're human or not. I really like these lessons in this game. And it's got a bit of a class systems drama thing going on, too, which I always enjoy. I think the MC is confident, certainly far more confident than I am. I mean, this bitch was out here looking in the mirror being like, wow, I look amazing today. And I'm like, damn, what is that like? It must be nice. But seriously, it's nice to see a confident MC. She's got a lot going on. She's got it going on. She knows it. That's not every Atome. But even so, would I buy this as game as a gift for Hannah, for my friend Lauren, for me? Probably not. I would buy this for a middle school or early high school player. And that's not a diss to the Atome genre. Not at all. You know, Atome does have its, its roots in coming-of-age media. It still has a lot of younger titles, and this is one of those titles. Now that we talk story, let's briefly talk about localization before we go into rating here. I didn't love the localization of the game. I found the main script to be pretty uh, interestingly localized. I wondered if a native English speaker had localized the script. Some of it felt a little off. I found myself wishing it was a little more thoughtfully translated for our language. Maybe that's a matter of taste, but the localization of the UI itself uh, did have some big oversights that I don't feel were a matter of taste. I noticed this when I hit the, the button to test this quick save feature. 
if you're playing this on Switch, you'll be doing this accidentally all the time, by the way. When you press the button that for quick saving, it says, are you sure to quick saving? And whatever is really truly happening with the sprites, to me that alone implies that at least the final Switch version was probably not play tested, definitely not play, play tested by a native English speaker who would have been free to suggest edits. So on that note, I can go into rating. All right. Well, I just wanted to, to quick say that the develop, uh, the email that we heard from P cube is that the developers were aware of the, the graphical issues. Their statement is that while in docked mode, the game runs at 4k while in handheld, it runs at 1k. Now we know the switch doesn't output at 4k. So my guess is that the assets are in 4k and they have separate lower res assets for in handheld. They say using a higher resolution would significantly drop the frame rate by 10 to 15 frames. Some images like Val are not as sharp due to the large size of the sprite. So, yeah, I can respect that. That makes sense. Uh, I do I do have to call this one to deny it. Uh, this is my first Otome in three years of reviewing games that hasn't gotten a try it or better. Charade Maniacs and Winter's Wish were not my favorite games. Both of those get a try it from me because I can see objectively they're both made with love and lots of people ended up liking both those titles. For this one, at least for this time, I don't think even at the non-voice 30-ish dollar price point for visual novels, that this will be something necessarily that my community specifically uh, will will want to purchase. So let's say that patches do happen someday in the future for the UI localization. Uh, at least, or if even if they uh, at least patch the sprites to just be configured to the same resolution as each other, no matter which direction they want to take it in. Maybe they want to make all the sprites a little lower resolution. I would be happy with that. I would then bump this up to a try it for a mostly younger demographic than we're talking, uh, usually talking on the show. And you, on a you final just note want here, the visuals to be uniform. Yeah, I'm totally fine with that. So, P-Cube, on a final note, I want to say I love you guys. I've given all your games until now, not just to try it, but buy it. Even B-Project, and I don't even know those characters. And I know Busta <laughs> Phillips 2 next year is going to be a knockout. So, please don't hate me, and please don't break up with me. Not today. Uh, it's my birthday. You can't legally break up with me on my birthday. I hate to play that card, but what else are you going to do with it? What else are you going to do with a birthday card? All right, review over. Oh. <laughs> it's your birthday. It's your birthday. Thank you for I now. never know where to go after your reviews. <laughs> <laughs> me neither, man. What else are you going to yeah. do with a birthday card is actually got me lost in thought now. <laughs> that was for you, man. You can always tell it. the ones that are for you. I love it. I'm going to use that in two weeks when it's my birthday. Yes, I know that's coming up. 28th, yeah. is that right? 27, but very close. Oh my God, I do that every year. <laughs> it is the season. It is the season. Whose birthday is two weeks after yours? Mine? Yeah, uh, there's got to be somebody. Hold up, let me check Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can see upcoming birthdays pretty, oh, even though it doesn't always remind that. me of when they are. Oh, but it is telling me about Brooks. So that's hey. Um, mm. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Two weeks after the 27th, so it's 3-11. It would have to be October 11th. Uh, this oh, guy then that'll that... be my three-year anniversary of SML. Haha. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. Uh, a guy when you're Fort doing Worth this once shit. who friended me. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Schnabubula. There's Ooh, a... Schnabubula. Yeah, that's it. I like boobs. Boobs are nice. Here, here. Next game to talk about is Ant Stream Arcade, developed and published by Ant Stream Arcade. Released September 6th on PS4 and PS5 is a subscription-based service. It is one year for $39.99 or a lifetime pass for $99.99. Play over 1,300 retro games and enjoy a lifetime of gaming, compete in global tournaments, mini game challenges, community challenges, and team up with Couch Co-op. Uh, Chris, we checked this out back on the Xbox when it first launched and really enjoyed our time with it. Uh, you're the, the classic game guy, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Antstream Arcade now that it is on PlayStation. Give us your thoughts. Man. Well, I think you asked me what my thoughts were back when you reviewed it, even though I didn't have access to it at the time. And I was just like, I, I was pretty, um, I was very interested in the list, um, which, by the way, um, anybody that wants to read along to the list of games. Because I'm going to list all of them. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, Jesus. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> what, a, what a review that would be. 
Um, if you go to antstream.com and uh, slash games, it'll show you like the entire list of games. And so, you know, you're welcome. Um, looking for them to add that second Atari 5200 game. <laughs> uh, they got Frisky Tom. That's all you need. No, I don't know. I don't know that stuff. But um, anyways, yeah. So Antstream, um, yeah, I'm interested in this. It's a very um, interesting collection of uh, what appears to be like, you know, must be like a licensing nightmare. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's stuff that goes all the way. Uh, it's at at the time of this recording, it's over 1300 games. Uh, that you have access to in kind of a central hub. Um, and the, like I said, the the list of games goes from older Atari, which is kind of, um, you know, the, the older Atari and computer games and such is like one big pillar of this, uh, of this collection. Another big pillar is um, like, you know, um, arcade stuff lots and lots of arcade games uh 295 according to this web page right now um and that's you know ports of arcade games specifically not just like the home version of them um and then the other pillar is like um just the most random <laughs> home console uh games from like the nes through the ps1 uh and of course the atari systems that uh that that you've maybe heard of um so yeah really uh interesting stuff so uh when i loaded it up then i uh, i immediately got challenged to a challenge game uh so that's something that they do where uh there's a lot a big online component to this uh to this thing where it appears uh, i got basically challenged to uh by a user it said but i think that the pairings are uh are basically um random so it just finds somebody that's online and says hey you bum this person is challenging you to a uh, banishing racer on the game boy and you're like what's that and they're like never mind you got to get as <laughs> high of a s- <laughs> you got to get as high of a score as you can with one life and i'm like all right so i start banishing racer i'm like oh this is like a a, a side scrolling like kind of an auto runner but with a car and like a cartoon car and oh i'm dead okay i lost and that they're like that cost you five points of the currency we give you every day and i'm like damn (laughs) so uh they're like do you want to try again but for quadruple the points (laughs) and i'm like i think i'm good (laughs) and so uh that's the that's the challenge um part of the thing so yeah every time you log on they give you like a little over 100 points um, and those just kind of get added to like a pool and um, you spend them on uh, basically challenging other players and trying to compete for online stuff. I guess it's so that you aren't just sitting there doing it over and over again to get experience points. And I guess, I don't know, pump up numbers that I, I doubt matter <laughs> in any way. Yeah, the, the currency seems kind of useless. It's it's basically just for challenging other people that I've noticed. I don't know if they plan on adding a full on like currency shop that you could buy stuff with, which I think would be that would be cool. That'd be nifty if they do it. But as it stands, it's just like there's three different tiers of challenges and you pay a certain number of points to either play it by yourself or challenge someone else. Buy yourself a trophy like based on your favorite game or something. That would be way cool. And then just like display it on your profile all the time. Be like, hey, look at me. I earned 2000 of these. Uh of these, you know, uh, you know, uh, Pullman script bucks. And, uh, now <laughs> I have, now I have my, uh, my freaking bubble bobble trophy. I wish I could remember anyway. how much currency I had, but my year subscription on Xbox ran out and I really, I'm debating mm. if I want to do another year of it or if I want to do the lifetime, but I'm, I'm more curious to hear like, how's the game line up now? Uh, how, how are things running now? Is the, is the connection smooth? Is the play smooth? Cause okay, I never so, really ran yeah. into like lag issues when I played, which was impressive. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the games don't lag. Uh, however, I will say that there are, you know, if we're talking issues, um, which, you know, that that's a good way to pull me away from talking about just the list of games all the time. Um, Yeah, there are a couple of little technical things that I would like to address um, on this one, just in my time of playing it. Uh, For one, uh, like I said, I just, you know, I I played about 40, 
40 games on this thing so far. So, you know, not a not a ton. I mean, that's that's a pretty good that's I don't know. It just depends on a uh, on on your interpretation, because, again, there's over 1300 of these things. But I played games that I was familiar with. I played some games that were like first time games. And um, the uh, for one, uh, the main issue that I have, and this isn't a technical issue, this is a design issue, is that uh, text, uh, you know, words in, in text do not just simply appear when you're scrolling through games. You have to rely on your ability to discern box art and logos, um, which is a, a huge misstep in my view because I play this on a TV from across the room and no text mm-hmm. is big enough, even for my completely normal eyesight. Uh, no text is going to be like... Uh, or rather, um, you know, there's not, you know, text is, sorry, there's no like game box art that's like, you know, going to like tell me what it is if I don't already know what it is. Um, so if you have like text on the screen, that's going to be great. Uh, that Then I can tell. But you have to um, actually click on the game or push the button on the game to get the text. And then uh, once you back up, then your stuff is resorted, you know? Like if you're uh, if you're searching for something or if you're uh, sorting by alphabet, you have to resort in using the same parameters every single time you look at a game uh, close up. So that that slowed down my perusing by quite a lot. And I am saying perusing in the classic in the actual definition of the word <laughs> That's to say looking over thoroughly, not um not just anyway, <laughs> semantics. Um yeah, so but technical issues that actually are technical issues is that uh, the catalog did freeze a few times. Uh, I often lost the cursor because it's just turning a white outline to a yellow outline when you're looking at something. And again, with the issue of having to press the button on each game and then backing up, you have to like resort everything. You don't know where your cursor is going to be until you start moving it around. And uh, and like I said, I lost it often. Uh a couple times the catalog straight up froze and then I had to, you know, exit the game, go back in. Um, the the one real sin is that uh, I did have a game crash on me. Um, it was totally rad on the NES, <laughs> which is a great game that I recommend everybody try uh, however you can, uh, whether it be in this collection or on your NES or, uh, you know, other ways. But um, yeah, I, I got through like one stage on it and then like it just froze on the pause menu couldn't unpause it or anything like that couldn't even exit it so i just had to exit the whole game um and then there's other little weird things uh for instance i was playing the game continental circus which uh by the way one thing i will say about this collection is that if you are not like just intimately familiar with every nook and cranny of all these systems that we didn't that weren't really popular here in the U.S., uh, you're going to run into a lot of great titles for the first time. <laughs> um, you know, ASO Armored Scrum Object. <laughs> um, you know, Act Fancer Cybernetic Hyperweapon. You know, like you're going to you're gonna have a great time learning some new titles. And Continental Circus, which is a racing game, by the way, uh, is one of those. But anyways, I was playing this, um, this, uh, this racing game, and I noticed... That because I guess I'm so used to upscaling um, old video games because that's just, you know, I live that retro life and I have, you know, all kinds of stuff to do that with. And, you know, I'm very uh, accustomed to different kinds of emulation. So what I noticed is that in these fast moving 3D games, um, oftentimes if the action got too intense, there would start to be extra artifacting on the screen as if. I was watching like a Twitch stream or something like that where the bit rate was starting to crash. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of y'all will know this if you ever um, watch a uh, a stream of Mega Man 2. Every time somebody gets to Bubble Man stage, that waterfall causes bit rates to crash. Oh, yeah. And then it starts, <laughs> yeah, and then it starts doing static and like all this other kind of stuff. Uh, that's what I was seeing in these actual video games I'm playing. And I know I'm like, I know this isn't part of the original game because it doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's not um, it's not part of the sprite array of this particular, um, you know, computer. And so it's distracting to me, a person who knows what this stuff looks like. I don't know how it's going to affect a normal player of video games, but I, I can't imagine that this is for people who aren't normal players or, you know, this is 
this isn't really for normal players of video games. This is for like people who really want to deep dive into into some classics. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean classics. I mean like the rest. <laughs> but um, yeah, as uh, for your question about the library, um, there's a lot of interesting um, non hits and like somewhat hits on this one, um, even from the last time I looked at it. Uh, now, I don't remember everything I looked at back then, but, you know, I will say uh, one thing that really interested me in this one is the fact that there are RPGs in this very arcade centric collection and almost none of them are ones that you ever hear in conversation with with anybody. <laughs> um, a lot of them are from the Sega Genesis. Uh, one of them I want to call out in particular is called Brave Battle Saga. Uh Let's see, what's the full title? Uh, Brave Battle Saga Legend of the Magic Warrior, which is a Chinese bootleg RPG that came out from a company called uh, Chanpu. And uh, it actually, like, stole sprites and resources from other games to kind of put together this RPG that's kind of like a little bit of a a Breath of Fire, but better. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And here's the other thing, is that this particular copy of the game uses the fan translation, which was shut down so many years ago when uh, I think Pico um, obtained it or something like that. So, like, it's weird that it's in this collection. It's like, this is a fan-translated Chinese bootleg RPG, and its cousin, which is called Canon, Legend of the New Gods, is in there, too. And, uh, again, like, it's, it's just... Nobody knows these games because they didn't come out in the U.S. Uh, they're only known to, like, you know, people who know ROM stuff. Uh, so I thought that was really, uh, really interesting. By the way, it did inspire me to start a game of Brave Battle Saga, albeit on my actual uh, Sega Genesis with my EverDrive. And uh, I played it for, like, two hours. It's actually really good. <laughs> so anyways. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to this. I would say that mostly the draw to this... Um, you know, the endless discovery of like brand new games uh, is certainly, you know, going to take you a year to get through, you know, like I said, 1,355 at this, according to the web page at, at this uh, printing. Yeah. And then, uh, by the way, that that will include a lot of like, here's the arcade version and here's the home version, too. So like some of the games are counted twice. Uh, Astian X, uh, a.k.a. The Lord of King uh, <laughs> is counted or- twice. Or Acolyte was actually saying uh, my favorite thing about Anstream was being able to try the same game on three or four different platforms to see the differences. Yeah, you can do that, too. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, it's great for discovery. And again, the challenges are interesting because they do change all the time. And, uh, you know, they give you enough currency to try a pretty good swath of them at least once. Yeah. So... Well, we got to talk about a verdict. Uh, a year of the service is 40 bucks, or you could pay 100 bucks for a lifetime pass. Uh, my big concern when this launched was how long is the lifetime going to be? It's right. been well, I mean, over a year now that it's been out on Xbox because my year expired. So, so it's still here's kicking. A, here, here's where my, uh, and I'm not, I'm not telling a lie here. This sounds like a bit, but my actual training as a door-to-door salesman will come into play here because (laughs) you have to think of it this way. Uh, How many years do you a plan on living B plan on owning a PlayStation five, whether it be (laughs) a normal or one of those cracking new pros that are coming out. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, C could you picture yourself playing a retro video game? You've never played before two and a half years from now. Because the uh, mathematically, the $99 pays for itself after two and a half years. So if you are going to be playing one of these games after that point, you've already paid for it and it's and it's done. Um, I personally am considering the lifetime membership for this one. Uh, like I said, they gave me a year with my review copy of this game. So I'll be in the same boat as Joe uh, by my next birthday. A hundred dollars. I've certainly spent more than a hundred dollars on a single retro game that nobody cares about. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Certainly that's less than uh, the second analog pocket I'm planning on purchasing in two days because they are coming out with the Game Boy Color versions. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but uh, yeah, I mean, it. I would say 
a month, uh, or sorry, not a month, a, a year is likely the most that most people are going to dedicate to this uh, collection. And again, that's for if you want the challenges, the... Um, and everything like that as a retro collection i mean a hundred dollars if you are really wanting to like add those to them i mean do understand that they are you know obviously online is not going to last forever the system does require an internet connection to even function apparently and uh you know so you are it, it is it's not ownership for 99 dollars. it's just renting in perpetuity uh, essentially so if, again, if you can picture yourself still playing these games after, like, let's say three years or something like that, then 99 is the better bargain. Uh, however, most people, I think, are going to go for the one year. So it's completely up to the person because this is really going to depend on the player. But I would say that this is a collection definitely worth checking out for folks who are interested in um, in old video games in any capacity. Um, Because even with emulation, you don't really have that experience catered to you. And I think that this collection could be catered a lot better. Um, But, you know, I think that also just the fact that it's there and it has a recommended list, um, you know, it's, you know, got like different things going for it. Like this will really kind of keep you interested, I think, for uh, for every time you boot it up, you'll find something that you are going to want to either play or laugh at or, you know, enjoy or experience or be befuddled by. Um, so <laughs> for that reason, I'm going to go ahead and give it a buy it. But yeah, I do hope that they take care of these technical issues and come up with a better UI, please. Just at least add text to the games while you're scrolling through them. I mean, even Nintendo does that. Yeah. Speaking of libraries I have that are way over the 1300 mark. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you don't, uh, by the way, as of this printing, uh, since I just added my newest games to it, my Nintendo Switch collection of games I actually own forever uh, is currently standing at fourteen hundred and forty one. So now I've doubled that in one review. I I don't know if I should say how big my Xbox owned library. <laughs> uh, it's probably uh, it's, it's it's entirely too damn big. Go ahead, Aki, take a shot. Is it? What system? Only Xbox 360 or? No, it's my red, my owned games on the Series X. Just owned games, ready to install and go. 6,000. 7032. Ah, I was so close. Yeah. Nice. Next game to talk about tonight, Harry Potter Quidditch Champions, developed by Unbroken Studios, published by Warner Brothers Games, code provided to us by Warner Brothers Games for the purpose of this coverage. Release September 3rd on Xbox One, Series X and S, PS4, PS5, and PC for $29.99. Also available as part of PlayStation Plus monthly game lineup for September. Your next chapter takes flight. Immerse yourself in the enchanting world of Quidditch by playing solo or sharing the magic with friends and family. Aki, tell us about your time playing Quidditch. Okay, and this... Uh, you create your own little team. All of your team is completely customizable from their face, their gender, to even what clothing they wear. You can put them in different school uniforms even, which is what I've done because that's more amusing. And uh, after you do that, you go in and you learn how to play each of the classes for Quidditch. Uh, the first one they teach you is the chaser, and there's three of them on the team, and they um they chase the ball, uh, hence chaser. Very simple here. Yeah, uh, they, they chase and they score. Yeah, um, and then I believe the next one after that was the, the keeper. The keeper. Okay, I'm glad you remember all these in order. Uh, yeah, the was... keeper is the goalie, basically. Uh, so they tend to stick next to the three goals, because there's three goals in Quidditch on each team, or on each side. And uh, you can quickly zip them between them, or just keep them in the middle and move them normally, which is really nice. Uh, because teams will sometimes go flying like they're going to throw it into one, and then suddenly zip over and throw it into a different one. So that is good to be able to have the ability to just boost over real quick. Uh, other than that, they can also kick people away from the goal, which takes away some of their health. Uh, we'll talk about health here in a second. 
Uh, the next one is, I believe, the Beaters. I think is what yeah. they're called. Or Jacob's Bludgers. favorite. Yeah. Well, no, Jacob's that's something he likes to do. Uh, and basically, they carry. Well, they summon ball a ball around them and then fling it at people, and then they can come up and uh, Billy club them in the back of the head, which is f- really fun too. Um, Wait, balls. And- yeah, they really like hitting people with balls. Uh, oh, like hitting people with balls. SML After Dark. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so their whole thing is to uh, take and get rid of people's uh, hit points. What happens when you get all your hit points taken away, that character is knocked out of the game for a short while as they're knocked off their broom and since tumbling you know, the multiple stories into the f- ground. Um, just onto and, the... C- just thud. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. I would uh, I played a beater a lot, and I just... I would just keep going after one person on the other team. I would pick one and just never let them go. And just keep <laughs> taking them. You're just a monster. Ball at them, bam, tackle them, another ball at them. I like playing You're a lot beater. better at it than I am. Oh, I'm not good at uh, the game. I just have fun with it. <laughs> fair. And then the last one is the Seeker. And they they play like everyone else, basically. They can, they can enact as a chaser. But once the, uh, you know, the little Snitch golden ball. Comes of, out. Yeah, the little golden ball of bullshit, as I like to call it shows up uh they go they're the only ones who can catch it so they go chasing after that which is one of the biggest pains in the ass in the entirety of the game to me um because for that you have to stick on its ass and going really quick and it slowly fills up a meter and when the meter is finally full you can catch it but until then you're just chasing after it. And if yeah. you leave it for too long, that meter starts to disappear. It's just like, oh, it's so hard to follow. Because it does not care if it goes outside the bounds of the level. You cannot. It will make it'll make turns, so it tries to stay inside of it. But it'll make a tur a wide turn and go outside of it, and you're like, you little shit bag. Because you will hit <laughs> an invisible wall. And then that completely destroys all of the speed you had and it's like you bitch how dare you yeah, well the thing is you want to try catching the snitch because it gives you a large amount of points in the game normally yeah. you're playing up to 100 goals are worth 10 catching the snitch is worth 30 yeah which so a big is point boost yeah f- and for those of you who are like that's not how it is in the books or movies you're right yeah they changed it uh usually they give you 50 points, and if you catch it, it also wins the game. Uh, they got rid of both those concepts, so deal with it. To make, um, it. to make it a more fair game experience, because if you're winning a whole... If it's like 90 to 0, and then the opponent just catches a golden bird, like, come on, you kicked their ass the whole game and you lost because of that? I think it makes more sense that catching oh, the snitch is not an instant game winner. I mean, you'd still win. It ends the game, but whoever has the most points would still win, since it's only worth 50. If they grabbed it and you had 90, you're still winning. But if they had 50 and they caught it, they would win, because they'd have 100 now, which I get, yeah, reasonably, that is kind of BS. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, and once you go through the training with all of these people, you go through a practice match, which is uh, against the Weasleys, uh, which is hilarious. Uh, and then you get to actually start playing the game proper. With this, you can either play online with other people, which is Mm -hmm. misery-inducing, and it basically, it tells you, hey, which class do you want to play as? You can either play as the Keeper, the Beater, or the Seeker, uh, because each one of those is also tied to a Chaser. Hence, there's three Chasers. Um... So you pick which one of those and that tries to put you in a match where you get to play that character. It's had an easy time doing that so far because it'll put you against bots until people show up to play the other things. 
Um, the game really doesn't mind that at all. Uh, uh, the problem with that is some people are already obscenely good at this game. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's uh, insane how, how quick people can get good at these. Like, the game's a week old, and I'm getting demolished like 100 to nothing online. Yeah, my first game, I think we got 20 points, and the other got all of them, and I barely managed to fly at all that entire game because I kept getting knocked out. Yeah, um, I, could, I couldn't score worth a damn. It's like every every time they would hit me, it was perfectly on target. Every time I would go to hit them, they would move at the last second, and I would miss. Yeah, and you had to that, be that real convinced on top of the me to not games. play online at all unless I'm playing with mm-hmm. a friend. So, like games like this, they make it so hard to get into because of the skill discrepancy between players. The great thing for everybody here who's like, "Oh, that sucks." The great thing is you only have to play five rounds of PvP to get all the achievements related to PvP. That's it. <laughs> just play five. You don't have to win any of them. You just have to play five of yeah. them. Um, and then you'd never have to touch it again for an achievement. It's great! Uh, I love that. It makes me happy. Uh, the good thing is the game is significantly better and more fun than I thought it was going to be. I wanted to hate this game so much. I really, really did. And it, I actually had a lot of fun. Um, because not only is there a PvP mode, there's also a career mode. And you can play that either solo with your entire team of six characters who you can switch between on the fly, or you can play it even with two friends, and each of you get to choose one of the character types and the chaser to go with it. So, I've only played solo so far. I meant to get Joe into a game, and I forgot, to be honest. You beat me. You would beat me. No, we'd be on the same side. It'd be oh, fun. We'd lose. Uh, Let's be honest. We would lose. Oh no! As long as long as I kept getting the ball, we'd win. I'm I'm really good as a chaser. <laughs> I, I really like being a chaser. I hate being anyone else. All right, you're a chaser. Um, I'm a bludger. Let's do this. Yeah, we can make it work. Uh, but yeah, uh, each one there's uh, when you go into the career mode, you have the training that you did originally. You can go back through that if you really want. You also have uh, the the uh, competition that's between the different schools or the different areas in Hogwarts, like Slytherin, Hugglepuff, Ravenclaw, and Gryffindor. You get to choose which one of those schools you want to represent, and then you play through an entire tournament against them, which is five games, and hopefully win. And then you can get to repeat it again, and you can choose whichever other class you want. Um, eventually, while you're doing this, you're unlocking different quests and stuff, which is something I don't really want to touch on, but you kind of have to. Uh, and they are for all sorts of random things, like some of them are, hey, play and win some PvP, others are, get a, pl- uh, a platinum, uh score for this type of character, that type of character, what have you. Oh, knock people off their brooms 30 times. Stuff like that. It's all just random shit. (laughs) I'd be shocked if you didn't already have it, to be honest. Um, (laughs) But you have to you have to deal with that kind of stuff to a degree, because that ends up being how you unlock the other tournaments. Uh, because they stay locked off until you finish one of the challenges. I don't know which ones, but the two other ones you have are locked behind stuff like that. So you end up having to play this game a whole bunch, either PvP or just playing through the exact same school thing over and over and over in order to unlock these other ones. Uh, I only know what one of them is off the top of my head, and it's the one that's actually between schools themselves. Um, I don't know what the last one is. I think it's a World Cup, so you, instead of Mm. choosing a school or a class, you choose a country to represent. Um, But yeah, I don't know how to unlock that one either. Uh, And that's that's really a shame, because, you know, after you beat the, you know, Hogwarts class-based one, you you kind of don't want to just keep 
playing that over and over and over, you kind of want to go and see the other other ones, see what's different about them, and you can't because they're locked behind. You have to do this, that, and the other, and it doesn't readily tell you what you have to do, so you kind of just flounder trying to figure it out. <sighs> but yeah. Well, um, the good thing is, the game is pretty affordable. This is only a $29.99 game. What are your thoughts on that for Quidditch World or Quidditch Champions? Can't even think of it. <laughs> Harry Potter Quidditch Champions. 30 I, bucks. I don't think it's a terrible game. However, this is going to end up becoming quite a grindathon um because it already was for me because you do get career experience as well as a battle pass uh, mm. experience with every level and they were doing two times for this weekend I, I don't think it's going as of this week anymore and even that felt really slow uh, even when I got into like the teens levels and there's over 50 it was taking a while and now it's going to be half that and that's going to be just what's normal from now on that kind of sucks but if you don't mind the bit of a grind that it's going to be then I think this is actually a surprisingly decent game, as much as I don't want to support the person who created it. Yeah. Uh, it it was good. It wasn't a bad game. I had plenty of fun with this. And if you have some friends who will join you for it, I think you're going to have a hell of a time. Well, I think the best solution, play it on PlayStation Plus. Woohoo! Yay! One final game to talk about tonight. We got Sunsoft is back. Retro game selection developed by Sunsoft, published by Red Art Games. Released September 6th on Series X and S, Switch, PS5, and PC for $9.99. Sunsoft Revival Commemoration. Three carefully selected songs from Sunset. Sunsoft's works from the 1980s. Wings of Medora, 53 stations of the Tokyado, Ripple Island are included. I love that they call them songs. Uh, right. Chris, what is Sunsoft is back? Why do they call it Wing of Medora? It's Wing of Medulla. It's the the title is English. I don't it's know, not it says a Wings Japanese of Medora. <laughs> M-A-D-U-R-A. Yeah, yeah, I know. I saw that somewhere. That's I guess that's sometimes how people um anyway, okay, let's talk about this. <laughs> um yeah, so uh Sunsoft is back, baby. Uh not just because uh gimmick keeps getting re-released on things. Um, you know, including the switch, and I actually so just, weird that the description I have says Medora, and the one on the switch says Medulla. Yeah, I'll I'll get into That's that. Weird. Don't worry, Medulla Oblongata. <laughs> That's the one. Um, but yeah, I uh, I so I recently purchased uh one of those like Evercade handheld devices. It's the Taito one that they sell at like GameStop that has like eighteen games already built in. Um, cause I've always wanted to play portable bubble bobble. Never mind, It's been available for centuries, but, um, yeah, I bought, uh, two Evercade carts and both of them were the volume one and volume two of the Sunsoft collection. So nice. just to let you know, bit of a fan of Sunsoft, uh, especially in the NES days, you may remember them, uh, from coming out with games like Blaster Master, uh, Journey to Silius, frickin' Batman, um gremlins to the new batch which is actually better than you think it is <laughs> um but yeah like and you know of course they went on to uh do weird stuff like you know arrow the acrobat and zero the kamikaze squirrel and then of course they kept games from us like euphoria the saga and the aforementioned mr gimmick and trip world at least until like the last like year or so <laughs> but um we're not holding that against them um this is uh, Red Arts Games' uh, compilation of some very early Sunsoft games. There are three of them, and you have never played them if you are American and never really messed with emulation. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit of a... It definitely feels like a Volume 1 kind of situation, you know? Like, at least I hope so. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it's not like we're ever going to see Batman again, because, you know, that would require a license. But, um, you know, maybe they could do what they did with Journey to Silius and just make it a different thing. Because <laughs> uh, that was a that was a um, a Terminator game originally. Huh. But, um, yeah, if you didn't know. 
uh, if you load up Journey to Silius, it actually was supposed to be a Terminator video game, and they didn't get the license, so they just made an original story out of it. But they kept the uh, the T. What's the original Terminator? The T six hundred. Um, Odd. Whatever the the Arnold Schwarzenegger skeleton stop motion thing. The T eight hundred. Probably. I know T one thousand was Terminator two. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this compilation, like I said, is going to be three of the Famicom games, uh, two of them from 1986 and one of them from 1988. So all of these games are um, early NES games uh, after the original Mario, but before Mario 3. That's, uh, <laughs> that's how us Americans measure um, NES games, I guess. Uh, so basically, one of them is... Oh, geez, how did they translate? Firework Thrower Kantaro's 53 Stations of the Tokaido, which is a, a very Japanese game, uh, you know, about a fireworks maker who has to make it across these famous 53 Stations of the Tokaido line, uh, which you would not know as, a, as an American unless you were just really into wood carvings, um, specifically Japanese ones, because that's, uh, that's a series that is also called that. Um me a second cats are fighting i'll be right back <laughs> yeah no problem. keep talking just... yeah 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 uh so it's a game where you play as uh as Kanto Kantaro, uh who or Kantaro, whatever I'm, I'm i'm an english speaker i don't do well with words uh who basically you know has to go in a, it's a side scrolling thing where you have a weapon which is just bombs that you kind of fling across you know an arc uh and of course they're fireworks because you're a fireworks maker and you uh you defeat ninjas who are after you while you're trying to get to your uh to your lover in Edo um and by crossing, you know, those 53 stations. Um it's very quirky. Uh it's like I said it definitely has that early very flat looking kind of, you know, NES graphics uh that I I really quite love. Um and yeah, it's an interesting one in the sense that uh if you get hit once in the game you die. <laughs> so it's no, and you also get only Ooh. one continue. Uh, that is to say, no continues. Once you lose your lives, you start all over. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it's a brutally difficult game. Can you still hear me, Joe? I can, uh, if that matters. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I don't. Think, I think I'm coming through the headphones. Anyways, what's up? I'm um, back. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about 53 stations of the Tokaido. And, um, I, love, I love when the cats decide to fight when I don't have my boot on, so I have to, like, hobble around the house. Oh, yeah, that's no good. <sighs> um, yeah, I always just shut my door. <laughs> um, well, my cats don't fight very noisily. <laughs> they don't really... The two youngest ones wrestle, but they do it very uh, quietly because they, uh, they're fond of each other. They're not actually fighting. They're just wrestling. Nice. Um. But yeah, I was just saying that uh, basically the first game in the series, 53 Stations of the Tokaido, is brutally hard because one hit kills you and three deaths equal game over total. Um, although you can pick up one ups and everything throughout the game, it's actually going to you're going to be required to do so. And there are some level skip tricks uh, if you want to learn them. Um, here's the thing. And this is going to keep coming back. Uh, this stuff would be nice to know, or the real functionality of the game would be nice to know, if the provided instruction manual was also translated to English, which it is not. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> you are given, it's an old school 1986 Famicom game, and you, although you are given English text in the game for the first time, uh, again, unless you deal with emulation and fan translations. Uh, the instruction book itself remains in Japanese. It's just a high quality scan, uh, which is, is going to be a running theme. So yeah, uh, the cool thing is though, that you do get a rewind button mapped right to the X button. So you don't even have to, you know, hold down anything or whatever. You can just kind of get yourself through the game, but it's, one of those things that's a little unfortunate because, you know, I hate to be such a, a hardcore uh, bad butt about all this, but some of the fun of these games is dying and starting over um, and kind of plotting out a path of uh, getting all the one ups efficiently, learning where the enemies are because they're consistent, um, you know, not just rewind this jump five times or 500 times because you just keep not making it, you know, Um that's just a little tip for you kids that want to try this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
but yeah, again, it's it's one of those for folks who are really interested in the old and hardcore. So maybe um, you'll know how to enjoy it for yourself, uh, and that'll be fine. So yeah, that's a uh, fifty three stations of the Tokaido. Oh, the other reason why I I um, regret that the uh, instruction book is um, not translated is because it famously provides lyrics to the background music. Um, mind mm-hmm. you, it probably would be hard to translate that to English and still fit in the meter. But um, if anybody watched a uh, Japanese show called Game Center CX, uh, which is an amazing show, kind of the first like real like professional let's play kind of things, you know, centered around a, a stand up comedian who plays video games uh, to completion in one day, uh, despite being a bad gamer. <laughs> um in the episode where they did play this game, they they sung along with the uh, with the background music, and it was very charming. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, so that that's where I learned about that. Um, but yeah, again, that would have been nice to have, but whatever. Uh, it like I said, the game is still there for you to enjoy, and it I think it's very enjoyable. Actually, I keep I keep getting game overs and just rolling it again and being like, yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> um, it's just I don't know. It's it's got that thing to it, you know. But uh, anyways. Then we get to Ripple Island, which uh, has been translated before as Lipple Island, which sounds bad <laughs> somehow. Um, it is a uh, so it's a little later um, in the Sunsoft like thing, but not quite as late as like I said the uh, the stuff they were really known for in the ni- early nineties. Um, <clears throat> it is a point and click adventure. Um, again, available for the first time officially in English. Uh, it is where you play a boy who has to find a a princess, and to do so, you have to befriend animals, uh, who can talk to you, and you have to, like, find things and solve puzzles and all this other stuff, and you, uh, have another friend who helps you along the way. Uh, it's actually a really nice adventure game. It's a little short. It's, like, about a three-hour game. Um... But the cool thing about it is, unlike a lot of, uh, like, for instance, the Portopia serial murder case or Princess Tomato in the Salad Kingdom, it's not simply choosing stuff off a menu. You actually do have a cursor you can move around freely. Uh, therefore, the game does feature a couple of uh, instances of what we call in the in the genre pixel hunting. That's to say, looking for that one thing that you click on to make everything work, you know? Um, mercifully, it doesn't have too much of that, but it's a it's a nice little change of pace in that it's a, uh, it's a story game rather than, you know, something that's impossible action, um, which does bring us to the third game. And my favorite, uh, The Wing of Medulla. Uh, so I, uh, I wrote an article back in 2011, uh, before all this nonsense, uh, where I, because, only because a guy on Facebook said that Metroid was the first female protagonist in video games, which, you know, is a a, a very, like, blinkered, ignorant statement that, you know, a dude would make. Um, I was like, okay, that's not true. Um, and so I did my research and found 13 other female protagonists that predate Metroid um, to some degree, or came out around the same time in Japan as, as Metroid did. And indeed, Lucia from The Wing of Medulla was one of them, and that's kind of where I discovered the game. It is a balls-hard action RPG um, where you are a female swords uh, woman uh, named Lucia, like I said. And uh, The Wing of Medulla actually isn't a thing. It's, there's really nothing in the game that <laughs> is like that. It's just a title that the person thought sounded cool. Uh, who came up with the title, and so threw that in there. Um, It is one of the hardest games that you'll ever play. Um, It is crazy impossible, because you uh, you have hit points, which can increase by finding HP increasing items. Um... The whole point of the game is to explore very maze-like levels and avoid infinitely spawning enemies. And I do mean infinitely spawning. Like, some of them will spawn as soon as you kill the the previous one. Um, Yeah, so it's a a stressful game in that sense. And they do so much damage to you that, like, you know, your stuff gets eaten up. The entire game, you have one life. If your HP runs out at any point, you are starting an entire 16-level game over again. It's like Double Dragon 3. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, a little bit. Um, I hated that as a kid. Though. One life, are you serious? 
Yeah, Ugh. which again, the game does have save states and a rewind button right there. So if you want to play this a different way, certainly can. Um, but the whole point of the game is to explore the maze-like levels and try to find all the hidden treasures that make you stronger. Because all you need is one item in each stage to get to the exit. And then um, it's you know it involves fighting a little mini-boss. And um, if you can win against the mini boss and get the item, you can leave the level. But if you do so, you may miss out on some treasures that are going to help you a lot later on. Um, so it is one of those kind of games that is designed to play over and over again uh, because you're trying to find like uh, your best path throughout the thing. Because if you save on, if you like save state on a later level and you're uh, underpowered, then it's just going to really suck for you. Uh, you yeah. make it still get through it, but it's not going to be very fun. Uh, having said, this game, it, it actually really rocks. Uh, I love it. <laughs> uh, the game uh, is one of those things where I always puzzled over it because it came out just slightly... It was developed around the same time as Metroid, but it came out slightly after. Um, along with Athena's home port, uh, which did come out in the US, I say this is the better game. Plus, it came out fully in English in Japan. Um, there's <sighs> not any Japanese text in this game whatsoever, even in the ending. Uh, the Wing of Medulla is the title of it, which is why transliterating it to Wing of Madura is so weird, because it's already in English. It's already the Wing of Medulla, <laughs> spelled out with Z M A D O O L A. Um, but yeah, like, it's a cool game, and I really think that um, folks who are interested in early um, video game female protagonists um, who may only know about, like, Athena. Uh, which, by the way, is also a super hard game. <laughs> um, should really give this one a shot, because I think it's really cool and, um, and definitely a cool part of the canon. But yeah, those are the three games. Um, as far as a compilation goes, it features no, t no descriptions of the games, uh, no history, uh, nothing like that. Like I said, just scans of the instruction books in Japanese, uh, which again, for Wing of Medulla and also Ripple Island, you could really use some extra instructions because Ripple Island uh, deals with icons a lot. And so you kind of have to figure out what the icons even do, even though they're fully described in the manual in Japanese. Um, but yeah, like in Wing of Medulla has a ton of power ups and like special weapons. And it would be nice to know what they do. You're even given illustrations as to how the weapons work, but good luck, you know, matching that with the uh, with the fully in English game. Mm. Uh, and the other thing is that like the the other like the display options are odd because you have a CRT filter, of course, it puts lines across the screen. It puts curves on the ends of the screen, but all it's doing is clipping a curve out of the flat image. It doesn't make the image round like it would look on a CRT. It's just like, you know, it's just kind of a, a lie. Uh, it also gives you um, color filter options where you can do vanilla, which just shows you the game. You can change it to Game Boy look, even though none of these games came out on the Game Boy. Um, you can change it to black and white or red and black. Uh, which is you virtual, know, virtual child. <laughs> well, they call it virtual child, but um, nice. but the interesting thing is about it is they don't reverse the contrast, so it's like a lot of blinding red rather than what the virtual boy actually did, which was put red on a black background. Um, so it's, it's horrible. It's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, those are all options that are there for some reason. You uh, would be best to avoid them, but I really do appreciate that somebody out there finally had the wherewithal to be like, look, here's some old uh, Famicom Sunsoft games that nobody cares about. Enjoy. Well, it's 10 bucks. Should we enjoy them? Uh, if you listen to this whole ass review, then yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, well, it's, you know, uh, I did the calculations and uh, 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 the per game value of the ant stream stuff is about seven and a half cents per game. And this is about $3 and 33 cents a game. So it's not quite as much value per game, but <laughs> <laughs> no, 10 bucks for three, three actually good um, old ass games uh, from a great developer who again would rise up through the ranks to become one of the better ones on the NES. Uh, I'm going to call it a buy it, but if you are just looking for like the best of the best of Sunsoft, um, this isn't it. So, yeah. you know, you'll have to wait a little while for volume three or four, I think. 
Cool. But uh, otherwise, yeah, for retro enthusiasts, it's a buy it. Go get it. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. We made it through another one. Yay. Uh, thanks, all y'all, for being here, hanging out, keeping me company. Thanks to Brooke and Tim for coming on and doing their things as well. Uh, always good having Tim back on the show. Hopefully, we could get him back on more frequently. Uh, we just got to find more games to lure him on. <laughs> yes. Like, we'll, we'll put the yeah, game man. on a string and dangle it over him and just like, like a fishing reel. Ooh, I think this is the seen cartoons like that. <laughs> I think this is the record for the most games I've technically covered in a uh, in a single podcast. Thirteen hundred and fifty eight, all at once. <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> a dump, bump. Music this episode. Uh, should, what should we play? Uh, uh, songs with happy birthday in it. For Brooke. is there a happy birthday? You could play a gimmicks happy birthday song like my band's right. we cover gimmick, which is a Sunsoft game. Hey, it I works think for you me. should have that file. Does anyone have any final words to end the show? <laughs> Listen to more Steel Samurai if you haven't. They're a great band. And here they are. <laughs> <laughs>